everybody or oh, afternoon afternoon. <laughs> afternoon everyone afternoon. welcome yeah. welcome everybody to our zoom church um we've been having zoom church for about four months now uh, so time has flown really time has really gone by so we don't normally have visitors, do we? But we have one here with us today. And we'd like to thank you for joining with us. And we hope that you have a blessed Sabbath and you'll join again with us on a, another Zoom <laughs> church event. So I'd like to um, introduce our opening hymn, which is 249, which is Praise Him, Praise Him. Two four nine. It is now time for our scripture reading. Um, could I do the scripture reading after, please? Okay. Um, well, it's now time for our for us to approach the the throne of grace. So, if we could all adopt a position of reverence for prayer, as Sister Vickers will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. O oh, most gracious, ever loving, compassionate Father, we, your children, deem it a privilege that we can come before you this Sabbath morning to bow and before you and to give thanks and praise to you in this fashion. Lord, we want to thank you, dear Father, for this Zoom where we can meet with our brethren, even though we cannot touch or hug each other, but we can hear each other's voice and we can all worship you together. We want to thank you, dear Lord, for being with us throughout this week. We thank you for your many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We pray, dear Lord, that you may help us, dear Father, to continue to look to you from whence come with our help. Father, we pray, dear Lord, that you will be with those among us who are sick. There are many among us who are sick, and we pray, dear Lord, that you will be with them. We pray also, especially for Sister Mac at this time, that you will be with her, and may you bless her also. And may you strengthen her faith in you, knowing that you are with her, and you will continue to be with her as she go each day. We pray, dear Lord, that you will be with our young children, dear Father. Many are perplexed at this time. They don't, many may not understand what is happening. But Lord, we pray that you will help them to look to you. Help them, dear Lord, to be strong. Be with them wherever they go. Many are at home, they are at home now on holiday, and so we pray, dear Father, that you will guide and protect them as they go about. May you keep them safe, and may you help them to realize that even though they are saying that COVID doesn't affect mainly the younger ones, but they need to be careful and be protective. We pray, dear Lord, that you will continue to Bless us as we go each day. We seek your forgiveness. We seek your cleansing from our sins. Father, because you said that in your words that our righteousness are as filthy rags. Father, we help us, dear Father, to realize that we truly need you. And especially in this time, we need you more than ever. So we pray, dear Lord, that we may ask of you that which we need because there's nothing that we ask that you will not give it unto us if it's good for us. So may we seek you each day as we go, dear Lord, because without you, we cannot make it. We pray, dear Lord, that it's time that you will be with our speaker. As he speak to us, we pray, dear Lord, that you will open our hearts. You may send your Holy Spirit to rest and abide with us. And may you open our eyes so that we can be receptive to your words. May you fill us with your Holy Spirit, dear Lord, that we will have love and compassion 
and we may be meek and humble in our spirits. We pray, dear Lord, that you may guide us through this day. Bless each and everyone who are listening at this time or tuning to who are worshiping with us. We pray, dear Lord, that you will bless us all. And may as we worship you today, your name may be praised. And we will give only honor and glory and praise to you. For we ask this all in your sweet and precious name. Amen. 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 Okay, uh, at this time we will now have the children's story. Oh. Which will be brought to us by Brother Crosdale. Hopefully. Okay. Hopefully. Good morning, everyone. Afternoon. Good morning, afternoon. Every time I say morning, I'm corrected. <laughs> uh, and indeed, I'm rightly so. I hope everybody's okay. Are we got some children among us? Yes, yeah, some don't want to reveal themselves, but um, here we are. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Armory. At this time over the past few months, um, one of the things that's been dominating um, our lives is um, protective clothing whether they be masks or gloves or even screens. I've seen some people um, in, um, that take it so seriously that um, you don't know whether they have a head on their body because it's all covered in um, helmets and um, balaclavas and um, this, that, and the other. All because, of course, um, they are mindful that um, there's something going around and um, of course we're also advised that um, we need to um, protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to um, protection, if we think for a moment, um, think of the many coverings that there are. Um, what God has um, done is created um, creatures, animals with skins, hair, wool, wool feathers, shells, scales, even grass, mm -hmm. selecting the most appropriate for each creature and for the earth itself. Many animals wear ha hair, warm and light to um, protect against the cold and water. Um, just think of the problems that birds, fish and insects and other animals would have if their clothing changed too much. Birds wouldn't be able to fly um, and others wouldn't be able to do their thing because you know the way the Lord has um, made them is just um, perfect as he does with um, everything else. Whales have a um, two foot thick coat of blubber that on not only provides warmth but being soft more evenly distributes the intense pressure of water when the animal swims deep in the ocean. This diving suit is just right um, as a life preserver. Now, many of you may not know this creature, but it is a porcupine. It is a pretty slow, um, relatively weak animal. Doesn't do very much. Um, it lacks suitable claws and teeth for fighting. However, it is armed with quills that are um, excelled by nothing for defense. These sharply barbed quills are sufficient to teach um, almost any aggressive foe an unforgettable lesson. And I've seen um, animals of prey trying to um, attack this um, quite humble creature but those um, krills are actually quite formidable and they're enough to, if um, just looking at it doesn't warn them off, certainly when they touch them, they will see that um, it is a big, big um, problem if they, if they go beyond it. Did you know that elephants, sorry, did you know that elephants, um, the hide is one and a half inches thick. I'm talking about like the coating, the leather, 
I don't know if you've ever seen any leather that's one and a half inches thick. That is actually quite some thickness. Um, no mosquito is going to penetrate that. Elephants will break through the dense jungle where they live, and um, better protection could go. What better protection could God give? Um, against sharp thorns, trees, bushes that would tear and hide less um, um, if, it, if it was less than thick and rough. Grass is a covering God gave the earth to protect it from erosion. Rain and melting snow would easily wash away far more fertile soil if it were not for this beautiful protective um, covering. Again, we take these things for granted and we just think, what, what's the purpose? Now, when it comes to humans, we do know that um, to protect ourselves, not just from the cold or from viruses, it's um, from the enemy. And um, we will be aware of, um, you know, one of the most formidable examples was um, when um, Goliath, who scared everybody by his very presence, but not only that, he had shield and sword and breastplate that um, just the very sight of him would um, turn away any army. But we know that um, any armor that we have, it is no good, it is not effective as a protection if it doesn't have the armor of God. And as, as David and Goliath shows, you remember that Goliath um, had all his um, armor, but David, Saul actually gave him his armor, and it didn't fit him, so he, um, he, he, he took it off and um, put it away. Because as far as David was concerned, his armor was far more effective. It was better than even the mighty Goliath had because he clothed himself with the robe of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Now we know what the robe of righteousness um, is. It is the armor stronger than the elephants, stronger than uh, any other thick um, coated um, creature that there is. It says that we must put on the armor of God which provides, um, so, so that you may be able to stand firm against the, the um, devices of the devil. Now, the armor of God, remember, is um, we've got the breastplate of righteousness. We've got the um, helmet of salvation. We've got um, the shield of faith. We've got the sword of the spirit. Even the sandals that we wear, um, they have, um, you know, readiness in them. If we are clothed with these um, children, it will protect us from any enemy. Whether we're not likely to be going into battle and fighting perhaps Goliath, but at school, at play and other places, we have um, enemies, we have things that come and they destroy or seek to destroy us. But let us not forget and let's not um, let, let's use David's example that when we have the armor of God, even the humblest of protection will be effective in fighting or um, fighting our cause. The devil is out to get you. The fight is really real, but with God's armor, victory is assured, and we can say we can turn the most formidable enemies into um we can humble them because god is our um, protector and he will make sure that we're clothed with his righteousness we can defeat all the enemies Amen. Yes, we will now go to our meditational item. The meditational is, I was born to serve the Lord. After the meditational, the next voice you will hear will be that of Elder Griffiths, who will give us the scripture reading and the sermon. I was born to serve the Lord. We've got Sister Scarlett. Where is she? I'm here. Oh, praise the Lord. I could hear you. Could you 
mute your mic, please. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. You know, oh, sorry, Clarence, where are you? Here I am, brother. You put the wrong words in my mouth. I beg your pardon. Please forgive me. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. You know, it's a privilege to be before each and every one of you again this Sabbath. And I don't know what sort of a week you have had, but you know, mine, I can say it was okay. I've seen the hands of the Lord working during this week. And uh, I'm sure each and every one of you have also seen and recognized God in your life. And uh, we want to give him thanks and praise. Before I give you the scripture reading, which is taken from Acts, Chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. We're not going to read it now. I need to introduce my brother. I would imagine because many of us here, is there any one of us here who have not got an inquisitive mind? <laughs> Just a smith, I can hear you. Is there anyone who haven't got an inquisitive mind? I know those who are, and some put their hands up, some hadn't. Oh, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> right? You see a young man on your screen, and I know my brethren will be wondering who him. I mean, who is he? <laughs> <laughs> and so, I would like to say he's my brother-in-law. He is one of my ex-members from my previous congregation in London. His name is Howard Campbell. And you will see the AC. And, you know, he actually he decided to join us today and i'm very pleased for that so i would welcome to bilston online lockdown whatever we want to call it but welcome my brother it's good to have you today with us and i hope as marla said earlier on that you will join us again in the future. Well, so Beverly, good to see you. I didn't see you last week, Sabbath. Yeah, right, I can see you smiling. Thank <laughs> the Lord. Sister Smith, were you here with us last week? Yes, I was. All right. You know, I'm Nebuchadnezzar. Sometime it's gone from the mom. <laughs> I'm Sister Adina. Good to see you. Good to see you. Anyone else who was not here last week that is here today? Marlene, were you here with me last week? She cannot hear me. I'm asking if Marlene was here with us last week. Yes, we were. Yes, she was. Yes. She was here then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, unmute yourself. I mean, it won't bring out. Up <laughs> okay, I can't remember seeing you. So, look at the rest of you. Thank God we're here. Let's just have our scripture reading. It is taken from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. And I will be reading from New Life Version. From the New Life Version. Saul was still talking much about how he would like to kill the followers of the Lord. He went to the head religious leader. He asked for letters to be written to the Jewish places of worship 
in the city of Damascus. The letters were to say that if he found any man or any men or women following the way of Christ, he might bring them to Jerusalem in shame. He went on his way until he came near Damascus. All at once he saw a light from heaven shining around him. He fell to the ground. Then he heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you working so hard against me? Saul answered, Who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus, the one whom you are working against. You hurt yourself by trying to hurt me. Saul was shaken and surprised. Then he said, What do you want me to do, Lord? The Lord said to him, Get up, go into the city, and you will be told what to do. Those with Saul were not able to say anything. They heard a voice but saw no man. Saul got up from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he saw nothing. They took him by the hand and led him to Damascus. He could not see for three days. During that time, he did not eat or drink. In Damascus, there was a follower of the name, by the name of Ananias. The Lord showed him in a dream that what he wanted him to see. He said, Ananias, and Ananias answered, Yes, Lord, I am here. The Lord said, Get up, go over to Straight Street, to Judah's house, and ask for a man from the city of Tarsus. His name is Saul. You will find him praying there. Saul has seen a man called Ananias in a dream. He is to come and put his hands on Saul so he might see again. Ananias says, But Lord, many people have told me about this man. He is the reason many of your followers in Jerusalem have had to suffer much. He came here with the right and the power from the ed religious leaders to put anyone in chain who call on your name. The Lord said to him, Go. This man is the one I have chosen to carry my name among the people who are not Jews and to their kings and to the Jews. I will show him how much he will have to suffer because of me. So Ananias went to that house. He put his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has sent me to you. You saw the Lord along the road as you came here. The Lord has sent me so you might be able to see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like a covering fell from his eyes, and, and, he, and he could see. He got up and was baptized. After that, he had some food and received strength. For some days, he stayed with the followers in Damascus. May the Lord have his blessing on this portion of reading. The title of my sermon for us today is, Who are you, Lord? What do you want me to do? Let us bow our heads. Love and come, Father in heaven. At this time, I'm asking that you will cover me with your blood. Help me, Lord, that whatever 
I've got in my head to say that you will remove it and replace it with your word. Because you know what my needs are, and you know the needs of each and every one of us. And so, Father, I'm asking that you will supply our need at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our text, Saul appears not to know much, if anything, about Christ. Yet he breathes threat and murder against the unknown through prosecuting Christ's followers. Sometimes we find that those who doesn't know much makes the most noise. Today, atheists and others who claim not to believe in God spent a lot of time and energy persuading others that God does not exist. Saul was not an atheist, as you know. He believed in God. As a matter of fact, he believed in the Jewish religion. He thought that there was nothing more than the Jewish religion. And anything else that tries to compete with it, he thought, look here, it had to go. It was not of God. It was not of Christ. And therefore, he decided, I need to do something about it. Because of my position, God, he believed that God has given him authority. Because he, he felt he understood what it is that God wanted. And therefore, he thought, well, you know something, I'm going to put a stop to these people. He thought he had the right. He thought he understood everything. And therefore, he set out to do what he wanted to do. And he uses up a lot of energy because, you know, pursuing someone. Uh, for example, I'm thinking about when you're looking for a job and you're making application or going for different interviews, it takes a lot out of you. And so I can understand with Saul uh, reaching out to the various synagogue officials and asking them for permission to enter the town or cities or areas to say, find these heretics or find these people who are saying that they're Christians and they're going against the Jewish religion. I wonder if we do the same when we say we go out witnessing. Are we going out to witness for the Lord and to find people to serve the Lord? Or are we going now to witness to find people to become Seventh-day Adventists? There's a difference. There's a difference whether we are going to find people to serve God, to come to accept Jesus as their personal Savior, and to accept Adventist doctrines. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doctrines and what Adventists believe in. But I'm saying that our focus should be to find people to accept Jesus as their personal Savior. It is as they accept Jesus, then the Holy Spirit is able to work in them and to change their life. It's only Jesus can do that, brethren, not doctrines. And therefore, Saul went out with his intention that anyone who would not come back over to the Jewish belief, he would kill them. 
and so he set in sight and going to Damascus. In Damascus and its way there, as we have read and you have read it in your scripture reading, something happened. And he, God responded to him. This is what happened in verse 5, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. Right? It tells us from verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near to Moscow, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the ground out of the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Soul, soul, why prosecute thou me? Paul, our soul, heard the voice, and in response to that voice, Paul shouted out, Who are you? I don't know you. Yet Saul was claiming to serve the Lord. He was claiming that he had first-hand knowledge, first-hand experiences, you know, whatever it was. He was claiming that he had all these experiences and that the Lord was motivating him to do what he was doing. But yet, when the Lord spoke to him, he did not know who Jesus was. He could not understand it. And I'm wondering, brethren, you know, if you and I are in that situation today. I'm wondering if we are doing the Lord's work. If we are doing, if we are busy doing various things. And yet when the Lord eventually calls us, it might be in a small matter. Are we going to turn around and say, Lord, who are you? Who are you? I know many times I've found people that have made telephone calls to many, 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 many times. And I know you have done the same thing too. And sometimes they will turn around on the phone and they will say, who are you? Uh, who is it? They can hear your voice, but still yet they will have, who is it? They don't know who you are. And yet you've been speaking to them for years. <clears throat> Paul, our soul, thought he had been listening to the Lord all these times and he had been following the Lord's instruction. But yet at the crucial point, he was able to turn around and said, Lord, who are you? Saul would have had the surprise of his life. And this is what Jesus, you know, he would have expected Jesus to respond to him in Old Testament terminology. For give you an idea, he was expecting probably God to say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is what I command you to do. You see, brethren, such a, a prose, if God had responded the way that Saul expected him to, it would have confirmed Saul's behavior. It would have cemented his attitude. It would have made him feel that he was right in what he was doing, and that indeed he was following God's command. But you know, God is clever. 
as many of us have discovered, God is very clever. God did not respond in that way. God wanted to show him that his soul was wrong. And therefore, God gave an up-to-date up to modern term. You see, that went against soul experiences. And therefore, this was what Christ said to him. He said, I am, present tense, Jesus. That is Christ's earthly name. And with the powerful implication that not dead, I'm not dead, but I'm very much alive. And so we find that the second surprise, the first surprise, God did not respond to Saul in the way that Saul expected by introducing himself the way he would with Abraham and all the other patriarchs. He did it in a different format. And so the second surprise was when Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. With the equal powerful implication that hurt done to any of Christ's followers was hurt done to Christ himself. So whatever you were doing to my people, actually you're doing it to me. Jesus bypasses soul, highly trained mind, and went straight to the depth of his humanity. He appealed at his heart and gave a positive response as a result of it. Saul could not do anything else but to respond to it when he said, what do you want me to do? He reached the stage where God challenges him and he responded. Sometimes God had to move away from what we know or what we think we know. Sometimes God moves away from what we think we understand. Because many of us, brethren, we have got, our mind is clogged up with all sorts of things. And because of that, we become a stumbling block to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot get to us. We are so set in our ways, we have decided this is how God wants me to do things. This is how my, I understand it. This is how I was brought up and this is how I'm still going to do things. Even though the Holy Spirit might be speaking to us to say no, this is how I want you to do it. This may have been the way it was done then, but this is how I want you to do it now. And because of that, brethren, we find it hard to follow the Lord. But thank the Lord, brethren, Saul did not do that. He had no choice but to give in. Many of us, because of our standing, just like Saul, because of his standing in the church, he felt, you know, he had high office, he had high position. He felt he couldn't do nothing wrong. Whatever he did, he thought, yes, the Lord is directing me. So how about us today? What about us? We have good standing in our community. We're taxpayers, we're employers, we're employees, we're Christian, we're leaders, we, and in many other ways, we've got offices and position in church, wherever, wherever. And but no matter how our standing may be used to, useful to us and helpful to others, we remain people who are in need of spiritual help. 
who like soul in his need must call, must call out to the only person who is able to help them. We read that on the, the Damascus Road, the men traveling. This is interesting. We read that the men traveling, if we look on verse 7, that the men traveling with him, they heard the sound. They heard the voice. But the scripture tells us that they did not see anyone. That's according to verse 7. Today, as then, brethren, the people can go about their religious business, read the right books, listen to talks, sermons, sing hymns, they can pray, and they hear the sound and without actually seeing God. To whom the sound are directed, they will not know who God is, nor will they know what it is that God wants them to do. This is unfortunate. You see, brethren, we can share in the service. We come to church, we participate in the services without having received a spiritual challenge. We can walk out as unchanged as when we walked in. And I used to hear that many times in the past, that sometimes we go to church, we hear the message, we read the Bible, we sing in the choir, but yet at the end of service, we walk out the church worse than how we came in. Because we did not allow the Holy Spirit to take hold of us. And we see it here in verse 7 that the men who were with Saul, they heard the voice just as Saul did, but yet they did not see Jesus. Many of us, as I've said, we have set boundaries. And if God does not work within the parameter, if God does not work within the boundaries of our understanding, for example, if God does not send the pastor to you to pray for you when you are sick, what happens? Many of us will think whoever comes, their prayers will not be answered. God will not recognize that prayer. So therefore, we will insist on certain person, the president, the Pope, whoever it is, to come directly and pray. Because God will not. And even if someone comes in their mind, they will not accept that God heard and answered their prayers. Well, or whatever it is, you, you know, we might feel it has to be certain persons. God is saying here that, no, I will use anybody. And therefore, as I've said before, Saul had to turn. He had no choice. God did not do things in the way that he expected. And also the men that was following him, they were not expecting anything. They did not look for him. There's no record here to say that the men that was with him, they made inquiries to say, who are you? Who is that voice? Where is that voice coming from? Of what it is that you want me to do. I heard you too. Why is it that you're just speaking to Saul and not to us? There's no record to show that these men were jealous. There's no record to say that jealousy steps in. But I'm wondering in your situation, would jealousy crept in? 
would you feel jealous that God is speaking to someone and someone heard something and you did not hear it? God does not, as I've said before, God does not work within our own parameters. He does not work within our own ideas. He works within his own. We come now to Ananias. The scripture tells us that when God approached Ananias, Ananias was frightened when God told him the name of Saul. I want you to go to Saul. I want you to do this and that for Saul. Ananias you know, decided, you know, something. I've heard so much about this man. How he have killed the people of God. And therefore, I do not want anything to do with him. As a matter of fact, I want to run. And you want me to go to him? You want to set me up? You know... After Ananias explained himself to the Lord, when the Lord ex explained to him why he wanted him to go, Ananias changed his mind. And to me, that tells me something that many times, you know, I know, if I've been honest with you, brethren, that there are times when God will want me, and I'm not going to relate my story and experiences. Some of you here have told my experiences. And, you know, many times, you know, God would have wanted us to go somewhere, to do something. And we are determined to do something different. Right? And to give you an idea what I'm talking about, I know I told my brother last, I think it was last Sabbath, I think it was, yes, he's, he's um, signifying that it was, that I did not want to come to Wolverhampton. Right? The same way Ananias did not want to go to Saul. I did not want to go to Wolverhampton. I wanted to go somewhere else. And with that, I got in my car, driving up the hem one mile away. As a matter of fact, brethren, I was happy. You know, and but then it began to rain. Rain did not stop me because I, in my head I wanted to go where I want to go. The rain started, I could hardly see, the wind stream was really moving. Next thing to happen, the satnav went. It wouldn't work. Cut a long story short, I eventually found someone who had an idea of the address of where I was going and they took me to the place. When I got to the place, it was still raining, I said thank you. He drove off, he then reversed back, came to me and he made the statement. He said, referring to himself, I'm a born again Christian and I believe that God is telling me to tell you that you must not live here. I did not argue with him. I went back to my car. I told my friend that I was with that I'm not going to look on the house anymore. That you know, I'm going to Wolverhampton to my mum. We drove off, stopped the car, because I realised I needed to talk to God to apologise. 
because I recognize that God has been speaking to me, not through a voice, but he spoke to me, number one, through the rain, to say, hey, this is coming down, you need to stop and go back. When I wouldn't listen, number two, he turned off the sat-nav. The sat-nav would not work. Yes, Horatio, it wouldn't work, my brother. <laughs> right? You know, and uh, I was still dead bent in going where I wanted to go. Just because God did not speak to me in a voice form that I could understand. And therefore, he had to send another human being that could speak my language to say, look here, I believe that God is telling him to tell me I must not live in that area. Hence the reason, brethren, as I said, I did not want to come to Wolverhampton. But here I am, because this is where God wanted me to be. And I'm saying that it's the same thing, you know, Ananias did not want to go to Saul because he was afraid. I was afraid of coming back too. So I understand, you know, Ananias' apprehension. I understand that. And therefore, he went and he did what God wanted him to do. And I'm asking the question, brethren, how many times that God had spoken to you? It may not be in the form that you recognize. It could be through somebody who may not even be what we would say as a Christian. It could be through a song that we may not recognize as being a religious song. It could be through a book that we may not accept as a, a good Adventist book. But yet he spoke to us, but we did not accept it because no, God would not use this. God would not use that. God would not use him or her to speak to me and because of that we reject it and therefore the thing that God would have wanted us to do is not able to fulfill it through us and therefore Ananias went and did what God asked him to do and as a result of that, we have got Saul, which we know him mostly now as Paul. As a matter of fact, one third of the New Testament was written by him. So if Ananias hadn't done that, I know that God would have gone to someone else and used them to accomplish his bidding. The same way he uses the rain to stop me, it didn't work. He uses the sat nav, he stopped it, it didn't work. And I'm, as a matter of fact, brethren, I fought with that sat nav, you know, pull it out, put it back in, and knocked it, everything to see if it would work, and it didn't. But he then uses a human instrument to bring me to realization that God was in control. And therefore, I want us to think, what is it that God has been saying to me, to you, all these years, all these, or this week, or this month so far? What is it that God has been saying? And are you asking the question, who are you? Where is this thought coming from, who are you? And when you get the answer, did you ask or are you asking 
You might be sitting there right now thinking, you know something, I believe certain things has happened and I think God wanted me was to do something, but I've been reluctant to do anything. I wonder if you're asking yourself right now, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? I've been praying, I've been asking you to do this for me. I've been asking you to, you know, whatever. But God wants us to do something. Paul, our soul, had to humble himself at the time. He had was to submit himself and realize that he was not that high and mighty and powerful as he thought he was. And Ananias had to realize that he was not as timid as he thought he was because God placed his powers within him. What is it that you and I need to realize at this moment? What is it that we know that needs to be changed in our life? What is it that we know that God wants to do to fulfill his work? That we know we're not doing. You know, I know I can, you know, as I'm talking, there are things coming in my mind, you know, what I feel God is telling me that I need to do. And I'm sure you are the same. And therefore, brethren, God is looking, God is depending on us. Not just those who have got education or whatever, whatever. You know, sometimes we look on these people, as we said earlier on in our lesson this morning, that we look on other people and think, yes, they've got the education, they've got the skills. You know, Ananias did not realize that he had the healing power. He did not realize that he would have been instrumental in this man that was a murderer. He did not realize it. And I'm saying to each and every one of us here that each one has got certain abilities which God can use. And it just needs to be waken up. You know, we just need to acknowledge that God is on our side and that God is going to do great and mighty things for us. But in order for that to happen, you and I need to surrender. That's what we need to do. We need to acknowledge our condition. We need to acknowledge where we have been. We need to acknowledge, hey, I'm not making much progress in the way that I want to go. And in the way that God wants me to go, I'm not making much progress. If you and I can do that, you know, at the time, I'm going back to 2011, at the time, I had was to surrender. I stopped the car and I prayed. And I said, Lord, forgive me. You've been speaking to me, and I was dead bent. I was headstrong. I was stubborn. I told the Lord everything what I thought I was. Help me to have the courage to go where it is that you want me to go and to do what it is you want me to do. And brethren, it's about us. Paul experiences is our experiences. We need to, you know, stop playing church, stop playing Christians, 
and become real and submit ourselves. I believe from what we said in the lesson earlier on, if we can surrender to the Lord, he will do a hundred times more through us than what we are allowing him to do right now. And brethren, it begins with you and me. Not with somebody else, it begins with you and me. Not just with you, but with you and me, brethren. If we can do that, I'm telling you, you know, God will use us. God is waiting to use us. He's willing to use us. As a matter of fact, I can see him sort of crying out, come, come, come. You know, I, that is how I can hear God in my head say, come, I'm willing to use you. I pray, brethren, that as we go through the day and this coming week, that we will be asking the Lord, look here, what it is you want me to do. I know I'm whole, I know I've got this, this um, sickness, I know I'm, I'm limited with this and that, I know I'm in lockdown, I know whatever, whatever. Brethren, God is aware of it. God is aware. It, there's nothing you can tell him that he doesn't know. Only thing God wants us to do is to surrender. And when we do, I'm looking for testimonies at prayer meeting. I'm looking for testimonies in our family worship house. I'm listening for testimonies whenever I found you. Instead of hearing about the aches and pain, I'm hearing testimonies of what God has done. So brethren, let us ask the Lord what you want me to do. And I believe with all my heart, he will show us what it is he wants us to do. May God bless each and every one of us as we continue to serve him. Amen. 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 <clears throat> okay, uh, as we close our service, um, firstly, we'd like to thank Elder Herbert for allowing the Lord to use him uh, to deliver a message to us, and hopefully, um, we will have all um, found something personal in there that the Lord is speaking to us about, and like. Paul, um, let us uh, allow the Lord to use us to do his will. So if we could turn to our hymns, hymnal to 309, I surrender all. I surrender all. I pray that that is the desire of each and every one of us, that we will surrender all to him. Let us just bow our hands. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege you've given us that we can come to know you personally, that you're not some abstract person or being somewhere, but you are the true and living God, the one who speaks to man the one who created us, the one who fashions us, the one who understands each and every one of us, and the one who loves us more than anything and anyone we will ever know. And so, loving Father, I'm asking that you will help each and every one of us, regardless of how long we have walked with you, Regardless of how little we may know of you, I'm asking you, Father, that you will accept each and every one of us 
accept the desires in us, continue to create loving father, that desires that we need so that we can turn to you fully. And so, Lord, whatever difficulties we are having in our lives, I'm asking, Father, that you will put a stop to it. And so that we will be able to see you in your beauty and that our way will be clear and that we will have the strength, that we will have the interest to do what you want. And so, Father, we Thank you for everything you have done for us. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to abide with us and that we will give him that opportunity to work in us, for us to become the person that you truly want us to be is our prayer at this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.